since the Charter of Liberty and Deeds, and we know that we are safe in granting it, because too much departure from our traditional principles or from the 12 steps brings its own pressures and punishments. Leave it to John Barleycorn to take care of the foolish dissent. Meanwhile, let's chart our groups for liberty as well as the individual. This is autonomy. Now that we've considered group autonomy or self-direction, and we have said that every group has a right to be wrong, strangely enough, Tradition 5 centers on the single purpose of the ideal AA group. And the single purpose tradition has had a long history of conflict. You'll remember that back in 1938, when our trusteeship was set up, the original incorporation empowered AA and its trustees to participate in any and all aspects of the alcohol field, excepting, I believe, to lobby for prohibition. Uh, at that time, it was supposed that we should have our own chain of hospitals, and that we should have halfway houses financed by AA as such, and we needed rest farms, and we needed to, to get into education because, after all, who know better about these matters than us drunk? But long, long experience has told us that for practical reasons, reasons of safety, reasons of protection against compromising our energy, and for reasons of self-protection, and for reasons of love, for all of these reasons, each AA group ought to confine itself to its single purpose. To read the tradition, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Immediately, person, people will say, but why shouldn't we be in these other enterprises? The fact is that each of us needs AA work for his own survival. We need to avoid complications and distractions. So we continue to point at the single purpose to carry this message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Now, another reason for the single purpose is our unique value to the alcoholic who still suffers, our ability to reach him at depth and live where he lives with him in his cave and bring him out into the light. This is a unique faculty that we have. Now then, this cannot yet be duplicated by any other group or any approach. And thus far, it has brought sobriety in 15,000 groups to maybe 500,000 AA members. Our assignment is still enormous, just on this single purpose line. With our present membership, if only we could get alcoholics to approach us, if only professional people having alcoholics in charge would allow us to assist Instead of sobering up 20,000 drunks a year with the 12-step work that we do, we could just as well be sobering up 100,000 alcoholics per year. And God knows this is an assignment big enough. And we are uniquely fitted to do this by ourselves or still better by cooperation with other agents. So I think that now there is no doubt that every AA group will choose to stick to its primary purpose. AA members participate in other activities as members, as citizens. This is fine, too. But as groups, as a fellowship, national and international, let us cleave to our single purpose. Let that old-fashioned adage Shoemaker, stick to thy last. Be our primary direction in this matter hereafter.
Now let us move on to tradition six, which reads as follows. An AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Now this tradition is a great departure from our original views. And in the middle 1940s, we still thought that for good enterprises, the AA name ought to be available if they were primarily conducted with a, by AA members. And so with my full consent, we lent the AA name to an educational enterprise carried on by a great friend of mine. And the first effect of this was very good. In those days, of course, we hoped for more and more publicity. And when she went on the road uh, educating the public, uh, opening other facilities, she got a great lot of publicity, which brushed off on us because she had declared herself publicly as an AA member. Now, there were other instances of this, uh, which were really menacing, where people borrowed the AA name, broke the anonymity at the public level, and therefore were in full cry to get us married to all sorts of other enterprises. And so by 1950, we had seen the extreme peril of giving endorsements to the public level or of AA uh, members breaking the anonymity to public level and trying to draw the AA endorsement over onto enterprises of their own uh, for purposes of raising money and all that's publicity. So that became crystal clear. Now we have a tradition seven called every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contribution. Well, this look, took a long time for us to change our minds about. Uh, when our foundation, now the General Service Board, was first set up, we thought in terms of very large funds and thought ourselves very fortunate in getting some of Mr. John D. Rockefeller's friends to serve on the board, not only because they were deeply interested, but because it seemed an avenue to funds, which certainly Mr. Rockefeller would supply. For a while, it looked like he would supply our newly formed foundation funds, especially when in the spring of 1940, two years after it started, he suddenly announced that he would like to give a dinner and invite his friends to hear the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, sure enough, the night came. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller represented his father, who turned out to be sick. Uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick appeared, and a great many notables in finance and in other activities 